cookies, so you guys are welcome to join us for fellowship afterwards, okay? So, um, now I'm going to read the passage for today, okay? So this is from Ephesians 1, starting at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us all, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. City Church. Um, it's been uh, three months uh, since we've been meeting, me and uh, about 20 people or so we've been meeting together and we've been uh, just praying about church and praying about what church is supposed to be and I'm just kind of praying and in one sense dreaming about this day. Um, and now that this day is here, I feel like we need a vacation. <laughs> but I feel like um, the launch has begun. You know, we're just getting started, but I feel like we need a vacation. So please do pray for us. And so with that, I do want to encourage you to think about uh, partnering with us, even in a small way of praying uh, for our church uh, once a week. And you will receive emails for that. Um, I want to thank uh, those of you who are here. I know many of you are committed to your local church. I want to continue to encourage you to stay at those churches and to serve there well, uh, but also to pray for us and partner with us in whichever way possible. And if you are someone who uh, is looking for a church, uh, maybe you can find that community here, um, and that would be uh, great for you guys to be able to join with us. Let's go into the Word, and before I do, let me pray for the sermon. Uh, God, we come before you. And God, we recognize uh, what has uh, been established here right now. It's not by my doing, it's not by our team's doing. God, you are doing this. You have been on mission since Genesis 12. You've been on mission, a mission to redeem a people for yourself. And so God, we recognize this is the fruit of your labor. And so, God, we humble ourselves before you, and we ask you, God, that you would continue to reveal yourself uh, to us. We pray that through uh, this church, that many people would come to know Christ. Not just the idea of Christ, not just a name that's been spoken about a religion, but, God, that they would come to know the living God who is present here. And so, God, we pray that that would happen through today the many services that we will uh, be having in the future. And we pray that you would raise up uh, true followers of you who want to live as you live, loving radically, sacrifice, sacrificing much uh, so that people can know what true love is. Uh, God, I, I give myself to you now. Uh, may my words, my thought, my heart, everything of me be of you. God, may you speak as you are so faithful in doing. May you speak your living words. Because, God, you are living. You are active. God, may you speak through, through me to us. And, God, for us here, give us ears to truly hear from you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Uh, back in seminary, uh, there was a man named Brian Chapel who greatly impacted my life. I had grown up a Christian uh, for most of my life. I consider my testimony one of those where I've known Jesus uh, since I was in 
Uh, as young as I can remember, I had memories of trying to live faithfully for him. He was never just something that was taught at church, but he was someone that I knew in real life. And uh, Brian Chapel uh, came into my life in seminary, and he, he shared this one story in seminary that has impacted me ever since. Although I was a Christian from a young age, I think it was in seminary where the gospel uh, came to life, truly came to life for me. He shared about a radio program uh, that you would hear. So right as the, the night finishes up, uh, the late night programming finishes up, and before the early morning program, there was a short section uh, of, of time in the radio where it was called The Thought for the Day. And a man named Richard Evans would uh, share during that time. And Richard Evans, what he would say during this time is, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. And he would actually go back into what exasperating means. Uh, the idea of it is, is, it goes back in the Old Testament when God, uh, in his anger and wrath towards such evil deeds, he would have that idea of exasperating them because of the evil deeds that they do. And he says how important it is for them at that time to understand that when you exasperate, you're doing something that only God should be doing. And so then he goes on uh, to say, So fathers, do not exasperate your children. Don't ask them of things that you can't do yourself. So people would hear this every morning, um, these different thoughts by Richard Evans. Another thought that he would share is, employees, when you work today, work as you should do to the Lord. Don't work for your boss, regardless of how good he is or how bad he is. Work unto the Lord. So if you can imagine, in St. Louis, where I was at, uh, all these people driving, getting ready for work, they would hear these thoughts. And I would, I would imagine a lot of Christians would hear these good, good thoughts. And they, they would, I think a lot of them would say, yes, amen, yes, Richard, preach. But there's a problem with this. One, uh, Richard Evans was dead. Uh, so because he was dead the, and the recordings were old, the, the audio was horrible. And so you would hear all of, with all the static, all the messages that he would say. But there's another problem uh, with what Richard Evans said. You see, Richard Evans is not a Christian. He is Mormon. Uh, he is a leader of the Mormon church. He's a leader of a cult. And so Brian Chappell shares shared this with us, and since then it's, it's, it's impacted me. Because the problem is, well, the problem is not necessarily what he is saying. Because it's true not to exasperate your children. We, we read that in Ephesians 5. To work unto the Lord, do all things, uh, whether you eat or drink, for the glory of God. It's all true. What Richard Evans says is, in one sense, true. And what the problem is, is not necessarily what he says, it's in what he does not say. See, Richard Evans would never preach the gospel. He would never preach about God and His grace and what He has done for us. He would never talk about the atonement. He would never talk about Jesus, His life his death, his resurrection, and how that impacts us today. He would never do that, because he doesn't believe in that. Instead, he would tell you a bunch of things to do and not to do. And, the, and Brian Chapel ends that, that story with this thought. The problem with the church today is too many churches preach moralistic uh, messages with gospel, that are gospel lit, that have no gospel. Ever since hearing that, I realized how so much of my own life was gospel-less. I realized how so much of my life was what I should do and what I shouldn't do. How I should go to morning prayer. When I fail, how, how, much, uh, how, much, uh, how filled I am with guilt. And so much of my Christian life was like that. And when I started to hear how our lives should be centered around the gospel, it gave me life. And since then, my Christian life has never been the same. Salvation was always there. But I start to understand God and His grace and the gospel in such, in such ways that there was so much joy in my Christian life. I could, I could smile because I, was, I wasn't feeling guilty, but I knew what He has done. And so today, as we start off this church, Gospel City, the first message I want to share is about that good message. A message that many of us know in our heads, but I think a lot of us, we don't experience it or know it in our hearts. And that's what I want to do today, to that great Gospel message. How does that impact us today? What can we walk away with? 
What does the gospel do? The gospel cleanses you from your guilt. The gospel cleanses you from your guilt. Let's read Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the, 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 blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm, in the heavenly places. You see, when, when you read uh, this, uh, this text from, uh, from Ephesians, Paul was writing this to a group of Christians in Ephesus. And as he's writing this, there are moments in time where he simply has an outburst of praise. As he's thinking about God and what he is doing, there's moments he just pauses and writes down a different sentence about how he wants to worship the Lord. So in here he says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ and with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. What has God done? What God has done is he has given us every spiritual blessing, every blessing that's out there he's given to us in Christ. And in the gospel, regardless of how good or bad you are, in the gospel that's true of you. That if you are one who believes in Jesus, his life, his death, and his, re his resurrection, you put your life and you, and, and, and you put your faith into him, all that is true, every spiritual blessing, because God is spiritually wealthy. Uh, recently, uh, in the U.S., there was a Powerball. Many of you uh, know about it because of Facebook and different things. The Powerball, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, was up to $1.6 billion. More money than all of us combined you know, times infinity, basically, right? $1.6 billion. I was trying to figure out, okay, how much is $1.6 billion? So I, was, I was trying to figure out, okay, if I had $1.6 billion today, if I lived 50 more years, uh, how much uh, would I be able to live on from $1.6 billion? So I took out, took out my phone, opened up the, the calculator app, and $1.6 billion is so much, you can't even put in $1.6 billion on your phone. It actually stops. And so you have to put it into the landscape mode, and now you have more numbers. So $1.6 billion divided by 365 days for 50 years, Approximately, you could live on $100,000 a day. $100,000 a day you could live on, right? I could build a whole church building, right? I could do all these different things. With $1.6 billion, you could live on $100,000 a day. You could uh, buy uh, four 747 Boeings. Uh, each one is about, about $350 million. That seats about... Uh, 560 people, you could have four Boeings, you could finance your own epic movie series trilogy. Uh, Star Wars costs approximately 800 million, so you could actually finance two Star Wars trilogies all on your own. You could be the next J.J. Abrams, or okay? at least hire him to make your own. That's how much money it is. So when you try to fathom, okay, 1.6 billion is a lot of money. What Jesus says is you have every spiritual blessing, you have to wonder and think, what does that mean? Because sometimes in my life, I don't necessarily feel like that. So let's look into that. What does it mean that we have every spiritual blessing? In verse 4, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. I want to look into those two words today. Uh, he chose us in Him before the foundation, before things began. He chose us that we should be holy and blameless. The idea of holy, we'll address it in a moment, is basically that we, we live how we ought to live. The way in which you want to live, the way you know is right, you're able to live like that. We'll address it in a moment, but I want to focus on this idea of being blameless. He chose us before the foundation of the world to be blameless before Him. What does it mean to be blameless? It means that you have freedom from your sin, but also means, in this term, it has, a, it has a nuance of you are not just freed from your sin, you're freed from your guilt. The guilt that you have from those mistakes, you're not just simply wiped away of those sins, you're wiped away of that guilt. And we want to look into that. So in verse 7, when we jump forward a little bit, we see this. 
in him we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of our, of our trespasses. It's this idea that through his blood, as he has poured out his life for you on the cross, you find forgiveness for your trespasses. What it means is offenses, the ways in which you have offended God. Knowingly or not, those trash, those offenses, those sins, those mistakes, whatever you want to call them, those have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. If you know your sins, if you know your heart, and if you are a little bit older, you know how wayward our hearts are. You know how wicked our hearts are. So you must wonder, why would God do that? Why would God, for many of us here who are Bible-believing Christians... You must wonder, why would God go out of His way to forgive us, a sinful, selfish, evil people? Why would He do that? And it continues on in that verse. According to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us. It does not say he, 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 he came down, he, he redeemed us, He forget, forgave us because we did something good. Because we made the right decision. It doesn't say that. It says He chose to forgive us. He chose to redeem us. Why? According to the riches of His grace, which is lavished, poured upon us. He is rich in grace. And this is the main idea of this, of this letter. He's rich in grace. He's wealthy in grace. He lavishes out grace in extravagance. Not just little amounts. Uh, great amounts of extravagance he pours it upon us. Redemption is all grace. Because he is wealthy in grace. He never runs out of grace for you. Never. You may be rich in sin. You may be rich in selfishness, but God is all the more richer in His grace. And so though you may struggle in sin day in and day out, you know all the wayward ways in which you, your heart is, and all of those ways, as your sin seems to be so great, His grace is always, always, always greater, which is why Paul has outbursts of worship. Thanks, blessed be to our God. This is the good news, amen? amen? And it's because of this, it's good news because some of us struggle with guilt. The guilt is real. Whether we're a Christian, whether we've come to that place of accepting Christ or not, the guilt is real. For many of us, we struggle with the guilt. We struggle with the offenses, the things we've done in the past, the things we've done in, in, in the youth, the things that our spouses don't know about, the things in which, as we try to love our child, we grow impatient, we start to realize how little we love even our own children. In all those ways, we start to realize the way in which we ought to live, we can't. We don't love very well. And in that, there's guilt for many of us. A sin that we've been hiding or struggling with. <laughs> you know it's evil. You know as much and as hard as you try, you can't fix yourself. And so although every other religion, what it, what it would end up saying is every other religion would say, well, you have, you have to shape up. You have to get better. You have to try harder. But in our faith, this is what it says in Romans 8.1. There is therefore no condemnation. None. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The idea of in Christ is you put your faith in Him. You are in, there's no condemnation for those of you who struggle with that guilt. I know some of us here probably don't have the ability to even sleep well at night because of different concerns and worries, but not just that, something deep within your heart is guilt. You walk with guilt. You walk with shame. And to that person, what God has to say, there is none, no condemnation in Christ. I'm reminded of a story of a brother who was in Africa who has never seen snow. A probably a cold day like this. Today is the coldest day of the year. On a cold day, he was in the classroom. And as the classroom finished, he heard uh, that... This is outside of Africa. Uh, this is in St. Louis. Uh, he heard that there was snow outside. He's read about snow. He's heard about snow. But never has seen snow. As he hears about the snow, he 
literally runs outside because he's so excited to see snow. He runs outside. He looks around and sees a blanket of white everywhere he looks. And then he looks up and he lets the snow, the snowflakes fall on his face. And people are wondering, like, what's, what's so great about snow? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, but there's a sense for him, he was, uh, he was having a moment. And then he says this, is this what it means? Is this what it means in scripture when it says, Though our sins were like scarlet, I am now white as snow. Is this what it means? And for a moment, he just couldn't understand how right before class, everything was dirty. But right after class, everything was white. That's what happens when you come to Christ, when you understand who He is. All sin is wiped away. Not just your sin, but also the guilt that you struggle with. That's the good news. His grace will cleanse you from your sin, but His grace will also compel you towards godly living. His grace will will compel you towards God in the living. Let's go back to that verse, verse 4. Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. So we just address what it means to be blameless. Not just one of sin, or one without sin, but one that doesn't have that guilt. But now we want to look into holiness. His grace is not simply for our failure. This is how extravagant uh, His grace is. He'll forgive us of our sin, but in that He'll pour out more grace so that we can, be we can become who we're designed to be, that we can become holy, we can become people who live in godliness. And so in all the ways that you know you ought to live, the way in which you know you should have patience, the way in which you know you should love your wife. In all these ways, we fall short. The ways we struggle with our own uh, sexual or romantic appetites. In all these ways, God, uh, in His grace, enables you, compels you to live like Him. And so it, it goes on in verse 4 and 5. In love, in love He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. I mean, do you see what it's saying? He's saying He predestined. The idea of, uh, pre, of being predestined is He knew we would struggle. But as He knew that we would struggle, He predestines, He chooses that in our struggle, He will still love us. So that's why it says, in love He predestined. It wasn't simply a choice. He wanted to because he was overflowing with love. And so it goes on in verse 6. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the, in the beloved. As you start to see uh, the dynamic in these verses, what, what's going to happen is he'll write about something that God is doing. And then he'll burst out on praise. So we just see that right here. He predestined us for adoption of sons through Christ Jesus according to the purpose of his will. And then he basically burst out of praise again. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. This is the nature of grace. When you understand grace in your heart, it changes your heart. It touches your heart. It compels your heart to change. A Romans 12, a very, very famous uh, famous chapter in scripture. Uh, as he writes to the Romans, as Paul writes to the Romans, for chapters 1 to, 1 to 11, basically chapters 1 to 11 is about how good God is, how great He is, how, how awesome His grace is. It's, it's all about that. And then in, in verse, uh, in, in chapter 12, he says, finally, I appeal to you, therefore, because all of chapters 1 uh, to, to 11, brothers, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. When people receive grace and mercy in their hearts, their hearts will always respond with awe, with joy, with thanksgiving, with a desire to live differently. J.A. Packer, a well-known Christian author and leader, says this, The secular world will never understand the Christian motivation. 
the secular world, as they observe the church, as they observe Christians, as they see them wanting to live, they, he's saying the, Christ, the secular will never understand the Christian motivation. They will never understand what makes Christians tick. John Bunyan, uh, who is uh, famous for writing Pilgrim of Progress, the best-selling book after the Bible in all of history, uh, he was put in prison because of preaching the gospel. And as he was put into prison, there were other Christians there. And so these Christians were talking with, with, uh, with, uh, with Bunyan. And one of the things that Bunyan was known for was preaching the gospel, and only the gospel, and letting the gospel change you. And so as he was there, they started to ask him, and these other people who are believers, but were skeptical about the power of the gospel, they had this conversation. The skeptics, Christians, but skeptical about the power of the gospel, they said to Bunyan, you cannot keep assuring people of God's love. You cannot do that. You, if you keep assuring people of God's love, they'll do whatever they want. And Bunyan famously replies with this, No, if you keep assuring God's people of God's love, they will do whatever He wants. You get this, right? I think for a lot of us, we get this. We get this idea of grace. We get the idea that, well, if you continue to preach grace, you're saved by grace alone. Well, I can do whatever I want, and that's true. And it's for a lot of for a lot of us, that's why we struggle and sin because this idea of amazing grace, and therefore we can do whatever we want. As I've understood this, I've understood that when we understand grace in our head, because of our sinful hearts, that will be the logical response. Oh, if God's going to pour out His grace, I'll just do whatever I want. But. If you not just know the grace in your head, but you experience it in your heart, that's when change happens. Amen. That's when you experience love. For a lot of us who struggle with this idea, of, well, if you continue to preach grace, you can do whatever you want. That's true. <laughs> but when you experience it in your heart, your heart's never the same. It ticks differently. It beats with a different drive. Amen. When the gospel is understood in your heart, it compels you because you've experienced love, you've experienced life, you've, you've experienced grace that you, you, that you know you don't deserve. And you, can, and you start to ask, how am I so blessed? How am I the one that God chose? How am I the one? And so in that, you're not compelled to live differently. Now you're compelled to want to love, to want to love your neighbor, to want to do all the things that were so difficult before, but now you have life. The gospel will take that guilt away from you. It will cleanse you of it. But it will continue to do greater work in your heart. And it will compel you to godly living. But lastly, it will carry you into glory. It will carry you into glory. Verse 5, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will. And I love these words. To the praise of His glorious grace, mm -hmm. with which He has blessed us mm -hmm. in the Lord. Mm -hmm. The idea of glorious grace. Glory is a term in Scripture where God's uh, invisible uh, presence is made visible. Uh, it's, his, it's His presence made manifest. So you see the, the glory of God come down in the, in the Old Testament. The glory of God come down in the cloud. The glory of uh, God uh, shone in fire. And so this is the idea. His glory, His grace is now made visible. Where? With which He has blessed you in the beloved. So not only is God pouring out grace to forgive you of your sin and to rid you of the guilt, He's also compelling your heart, uh, 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 giving you strength in your heart to now live the way you, that you want to. But from there, He now gives you Himself, the glorious grace, the grace that's here with us now. And so it says, he, He's predestined us as a, uh, for, He's predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. That you and I, just as Jesus calls God Father, in the Lord's Prayer, He invites the, the disciples to say, Hey, the Father that I call Father, the God, the God that I call Father, He invites us and say, You have now access to call, uh, to, to call God Father as I do, as I am the Son of God. Now I invite you to call Him sons 
of God. And so again, we see this, and I mentioned this before. He'll write something, a truth about the gospel, and then he responds in worship. So he says that in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 6, to the praise of His glorious grace. In verse 12, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ, now to the praise of His glorious grace. In verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it? To the praise of His glory. He may think He's redundant, but every time He writes a, a, a verse of praise, for him, it's a new song. It's a new reason to worship. And for the person who understands the gospel, you know that this is true. That's why you can, you can, you can come to church week in and week out. The worship songs don't get old because you have reasons to praise him for that week. Though he saved you a long time ago, you know he's still doing that work in you. So there's a reason for a new song in him. So the question I have for you today How do you know if you're gospel-driven? How do you know if you're gospel-centered? How do you know if the gospel is the driving force in you? How do you know that? The way in which you know if the gospel is the center of your life is a simple question. Are you grateful? Are you grateful? We know that in Scripture we're called to be grateful. We know in Scripture we're called to give thanks. But this is the true mark of Paul. He continues to have outbursts of worship. If you're not giving thanks, you're not receiving grace. If your Christian life is simply a list of do's and don'ts, and you struggle with guilt, you struggle with apathy, you don't really know what it's all about. The reason is, you know what you should and shouldn't do, but what you don't have is the gospel in your heart. As He saved you then, He works that grace in you today. And when you start to understand this, you start to realize everything that we do is a response to the gospel. And that's when you're able to finally love people with joy. You go to church because it's not a burden, but it's an, it's a, it's an expression of who uh, He is to you. It's all a response. <laughs> you have outbursts of worship. You have outbursts of praise. You don't ever grow past the gospel. You grow deeper into the gospel. You don't ever grow past it. It's not just for the beginning Christian. But for that person who was saved when he was 15, when he's 55, when he's 85, what should happen, the gospel doesn't get old and stale. It becomes deeper, more alive. It, cha it changes all of who you are. It starts to, it starts to uh, encompass every uh, fiber of your being. That's what the gospel does. That's why churches are planted, to preach the gospel. Because once the gospel is understood, that's the hope. For the world. Uh, Bill Hybels uh, says this, and that's been taken uh, to literally the ends of the earth. He says the local church is the hope of the world. Not just mega churches, not just big name pastors. The local church, that local church is the hope of the world. He says this when he was on uh, a trip to San Juan. He was doing some some work for ministry there. He was on the. He was getting ready to go back uh, to to Chicago, and as he was about to get onto the plane, he saw two kids, verse uh, ages uh, seven and nine, and they started to get into a, a bit of a fight, and it started to get out of hand. And the next thing you know, you see this nine-year-old take his uh, fist back and clock him, clock the seven-year-old in the face. The seven-year-old falls to the ground. He starts to bleed. Uh, Bill Hybels runs over to the kid, trying to stop what, what he is doing. The kid gets medical help, and he wants to help. He wants to, he wants to stay and help, but now that the flight is leaving, he has to leave. So he gets onto the plane, and then he just has a moment. He's just kind of shocked. He's just trying to figure out what just happened. He just kind of tries to take his mind off of what just happened, because he doesn't like all that stuff. So he, as, he, as he tries to take his mind off what just happened, he starts to pray. 
And as he starts to pray, he felt God kind of asking him, think about that nine-year-old. And he says, think about that nine-year-old. What's going to happen to that nine-year-old? And so as he's on the, the airplane seat, just kind of thinking what happened, he starts to think, well, what's going to happen to him? Chances are, like, will he maybe meet a teacher that will kind of take him and mentor him? Uh, will he uh, get into a company maybe that will actually invest in his life? do something for him, and maybe that will, what will, that's going to be what will change him? He starts to think, maybe, or what's going to happen? That fist will turn into one that holds a knife, maybe. Maybe that, that hand that will hold a knife will one day hold a gun. Maybe that, that hand that holds a gun will one day kill somebody. Maybe he'll be sent to jail one day. From there, what's going to happen? Maybe he'll never know what life is all about, and he'll die one day. And what's going to happen after that? Bill Hybels knew the answer. Hell. And he started to grow angry. And he started to think, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? And instead of him thinking, well, Willow Creek needs to do something, he thinking, well, the church needs to rise up. And that's when he coined that phrase. And that's when he wrote for the first time, the local church is the hope. The local church is the hope of the world because, because it's only the church that will preach the gospel. And preaching the gospel is not saying do this or do that. Preaching the gospel is saying, you, though you were filled with sin, God in His grace came after you, loved you, chased after you, lived His life for you, gave His righteousness for you, took away your sins. Preaching the gospel is simply good you preach the gospel enough to the people, they'll start to get it in their hearts. And what you will start to see are people, not, who, not people who don't come here just on Sundays, uh, feeling guilty or burdened or tired of church. What you will see is a people, a room full of people who know the gospel, who want to thank the Lord in their hearts. That's the reason that they will be coming to church. The reason the local church is the hope of the world is not because of great preachers. It's not because of great stages or great lights or great worship team. Not even a good community. The hope of the church, the hope of this church, is that we preach the gospel. As we preach the gospel, it changes lives, it raises up disciples, and these disciples will go out engaging in the culture, loving the city, loving the nations, and through it, that they will raise up more churches and more disciples so that so many more people can come to Christ. And so, with this, I want to read uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 17 and 18. And I just want to end uh, this first sermon with one, I guess, a, a promise for, for me. That every time I preach and every time you come to this church, that you will hear the gospel and all the implications of the gospel. And in such a way that, as this verse says, it's not folly, but it is the power in which we're saved. Mm -hmm. Verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the, the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us, but to me, but to this church, Gospel City, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Let's pray. <laughs> Many of you have grown up in the church and Many of you know of uh, what you should and shouldn't do. Uh, many of you, as you think about church and we're reading the Bible or praying, the reason you do it is you're driven with guilt, not driven by joy, not driven with gratitude. And so for you, all I want to say today is don't make any promises of what you will do, but make promises that you will simply go to God and receive His grace. Simply make a promise to God today and say, God, I may not be able to change myself, but God, all I want to do is, give, is come before you. Lay my heart before you. For those of you who struggle with guilt, what you need is that cleansing to 
be forgiven of your sin so that, you, that guilt can be taken away. And it's simple to do that. All you have to do is confess. That's it. That's why it's grace. We don't do anything. So whether you're a Christian or whether you're not a Christian but you're here to visit and support, if that's true of you, that there's guilt in your heart and you want to find forgiveness and be free, all you have to do to receive forgiveness is say in your heart, God, I, God, I confess. I confess of these sins. I confess of these struggles. Jesus, can you forgive me? Jesus, please forgive me. Father, we come before you, and God, we do thank you that you are a God of grace. You're a God who chases after your people. We are wayward, we are weak, we struggle so much. But God, the people seated here, this church, God, we confess the only reason we're able to stand before you today is because of you and your grace. So in that, we say thank you, Jesus. We say thank you for all that you have done. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your one and only Son. Jesus, we thank you that though you knew that we would struggle in our sin, you still chose us. And even though we still struggle now, you continue to love us. You preserve us. You make us more like Christ by your grace. And so though we may not be to change ourselves, we simply say thank you for what you have done and for your heart to change us. We thank you, we love you, we pray this in your son's name.